Hey folks, Steve here with a review video for 1918-1919 Storm in the West, designed by Ted Racer, published by GMT Games. Uh, well, here we are, guys. The long road. We have finally gotten to the end. Um, if you've watched my channel in the past, you know uh, we were watching for this game way back when it was on the P500. It was nearly removed from the P500 list because it didn't have enough pre-orders, um, and via some combination of good fortune, uh, the game stayed on the P500 list and was produced, and here we are. Uh, played and able to be reviewed by myself here on uh, camera for you. Um, so this review is based on the solitaire playthroughs that I performed. You can watch those videos on my channel if you haven't already. Um, I play through the basic 1918 scenarios uh, and the, the Plan 1919 uh, special variant campaign that's included uh, as well. So if you'd like to see the game played and really get a feel for what the game is like, you can watch those videos. Uh, I will do uh, what I usually do with my review videos and provide sort of an explanation of the game mechanics sort of in the middle uh, of the video. If you'd like to skip uh, to the end and conclusion part of the review, uh, there will be a uh, transition on, on screen here that will point you to the timestamp to go to to skip past all of that. But uh, just to give you some context, this is a, a World War I game, obviously, operational in scale, covering the, uh, predominantly covering the 1918 uh, offensives, including the sort of the Ludendorff offensive, also called the Kaiserschlacht or the Spring Offensive, and then the Allied offensive uh, in the later part of the year that eventually helped, you know, break German morale and, and bring them into a surrendering uh, position for the end of World War I. Uh, the games, <clears throat> the game uh, is predominantly uh, core-based and features infantry units, some cavalry, uh, and yes, some uh, tank units for the Allies. And in the Plan 1919 scenario, you have a little more variation on that, uh, which you can see in my previous videos. Um, I was really stoked to get this game. Um, I had been waiting for it for a long time. We unboxed it. We, we did all the playthrough stuff. Um, and I will share my broader thoughts uh, on this game at the end of the video with just this very basic introduction just to kind of explain what the game is. Um, so uh, something you should know is that this game was originally um, a, a set of magazine games or uh, originally a magazine game that has been sort of spruced up uh, with a paper map, uh, nice thick counters to accompany uh, everything else, some player aid charts, uh, and a, a basic rule book. So, this is a I go, you go, hex encounter game, sort of bread and butter, meat and potatoes kind of stuff. Um, and, and I'll say just before we get into the details of the game, this is a relatively straightforward uh, war game with not a huge amount of rules. Everything is very straightforward, which lends itself to being a good sort of beginner war game or, or uh, you know, so if somebody really wants to maybe get started in the hobby, this might be a good place to start. Uh, but it has its own own bits. It's World War One, which brings with it certain... Um, uh, certain game mechanics that some folks may may not like, and, and we'll get into to some of that into the, the middle chunk of this video. So, um, yeah, let's go ahead and transition to the details again. If you want to skip to the end, uh, we'll give you the timestamp for that, uh, but let's take a closer look at the game itself. Okay, so let's talk about the game mechanics and the way that 1918 and 1919 Storm in the West works. Uh, you can see the map here. Now, this is the remnants of my playthrough of the 1919 scenario. So the map is on the 1919 side, but the reversed for 1918 is very similar, um, almost exactly similar, other than a few differences in which hexes have trench uh, terrain in them. But you can see the map runs from... Uh, Belgium here in the north. You can see some of the channel ports of France. Paris is here, and then uh, some of the uh, border with Germany uh, over here. And it is a hex encounter game, right? I mean, we mentioned that earlier, bread and bread and butter kind of thing. Uh, and it is very operational in nature. So this is not a strategic game. Um, the box says strategic game. I would not qualify this as a strategic game. I should say that's that's my opinion. I guess. I, I don't know who wants to argue that. It, it should have been called an operational game, but maybe that's not a phrase that sells well. Maybe it's a marketing decision. I don't know. 
Um, but it is an operational game, which means that really you don't have control over uh, like production. You're going to get a set number of replacement points uh, for each side per turn. The Germans will start with a whole bunch, uh, 24 in the base game. Uh, the various other allied factions will have a variant number of replacement points that they have uh, saved up. And then you're going to use those replacement points uh, to replenish uh, flipped units. Units come in basically uh, one or two steps. So here's a regular French uh, infantry corps. It's full strength value, and on its back is its reduced uh, strength. So you can spend a replacement point to flip a unit back up as long as it's in supply. Uh, if it's been removed from the board because it was eliminated, you can spend a point to return it. But where those units will come back onto the board will either be on uh, the border here, if they're French or American, or the channel ports if they're British up here. Uh, and they'll need to be strategically moved to a city or a town uh, closer to the front to be of value. Now, one important role thing there is that you can't combine normal movement and strategic movement in a given turn. So once a unit is removed, it can be quite some time before that unit is back uh, in the front line doing a lot of activity. Um, so when you look at it that way, in, in terms of like strategy, uh, I would say that the replacement and reinforcement system will, will sort of reinforce a strategy of keeping units uh, hurt rather than eliminated and that way you're sort of more economically restoring your units. So there's no like production model. That's why it's not a strategic game in my mind. It's operational. You've got units on the board that are fighting um, and you get just sort of replacement points uh, at large to use to replace uh, your units, whether that means uh, their infantry or their more specialized units uh, like the tanks. There are some exceptions to that in the 1919 scenario, but broadly speaking, it, it's not like you have control over production. It's you're going to get a certain number of reinforcements. You're going to get a certain amount of replacement points to bring damaged units back up to full strength. Uh, and then, really, the gameplay is all about uh, eliminating your opponent's units and trying to take critical hexes. Uh, in this game, they take the form of morale hexes. So I'm going to zoom in here for some of this video so you guys can kind of see some good examples here of what I'm talking about. Uh, Rez, Rez, <laughs> I can't pronounce that place right. Uh, Epernay, uh, Chanon, uh, these have a little number in there with a the red text. That means it's a morale hex. So if you, uh, as the Germans, take those hexes, you reduce allied morale by that number, um, and then vice versa, you know, if the allies take it back, They'll restore the morale points, but then you also get those morale points if you take it. So um, the Germans will get three, the Allies will lose three for Rez. Um, and two here and two here, so like all together, these little trio of morale hexes are worth seven morale, which is pretty significant. Um, so you're going to be fighting over these. So you can almost think of them as victory point hexes. They're called morale hexes because they represent impacts to the uh, national morale of the factions at war. Um, and, and one of the ways that you can win is to bring your uh, opponent's morale down to zero. So essentially take enough morale hexes and defend enough of your own morale hexes that you already control to bring them down to zero. And it is possible to do that. And in fact, uh, in the regular 1918 scenario, uh, and really in the 1919 scenario, I guess, ultimately the Allies need to bring the Germans down to zero morale. Um, and they're going to do that by breaking through the trenches. And that sort of is the hallmark of this game in that, yes, this is a World War I game, which means trenches are a big factor, a lot of fighting in a very you know narrow set of hexes along the front line. Uh, but because it's 1918, both sides have the potential uh, to do some breakthroughs. Uh, and so, as one might imagine in a World War I game, uh, the... Uh, origin of that for the Allies are going to be the tank units. For the Germans, it's going to be these assault units, these Stoßtruppen units. Um, and so both sides have that capability, and they'll usually, depending on the scenario that you're playing, um, have access to those units' ability to infiltrate hexes uh, more easily at different points in the game. The game is basically structured 
that the Germans have the offensive initiative at the early part of the game, reflecting the Ludendorff offensive. The Allies will have the uh, sort of offensive initiative in the later part as more Americans arrive and tanks are uh, more readily available for combat and all that good stuff. Now, uh, the basic way that a player turn goes, each turn of the game, uh, which will run anywhere between 1 to 16 turns, uh, each player gets a turn within the turn. So there's for each turn, there's a German player turn, there's an allied player turn. Each uh, phase, is, or each turn, is started with a supply phase. So for each unit, and this is going to be really easy because for the most part, all of your units are going to be in sort of like this line that runs along the trenches, at least at the beginning, um, you're going to check supply. And basically what that means is you're going to count from that unit back to a source of supply, uh, if they can do that, without running into an enemy unit or an enemy zone of control that is not negated by a friendly unit, they're in supply. Very straightforward stuff. Um, for Germans, they need to trace off to the east side of the map. For the British, they need to uh, trace back to the channel ports. And for the French and Americans, they have to trace to the south or west edges of the map. So it's really straightforward supply model. Um, you're either in supply or you're not. Uh, for the most part, there's also fort supply. So if there's a French unit surrounded in Rez, uh, they can have fort supply. They are still penalized a little bit, but they're not just going to disappear uh, for not being in supply. But if you're out in a normal hex and you are out of supply at the beginning of a turn, and that's the initial supply phase for your, for your units, if it's out of supply and they can't be put back into supply by the end of your player turn, then they'll be eliminated. So you can eliminate units from being out of supply, but again, the forts can help. And if for some reason, for instance, the British get cut off from the channel ports, they can still draw supply from French supply sources, but they fight and defend, uh, they, they attack and defend at half strength. So that's called inter-allied supply. So there's more than just supplied or, or not supplied, but it's mostly straightforward. Um, but certainly some elements that affect what you do in the game. After you've checked your supply, then there's the replacement phase. So you're going to get some more replacements, uh, and that will be on a schedule. That's on the player aid chart. Um, you'll find that at the beginning of the game, the factions have some replacement points saved up, but everyone's going to be really low by the end of any scenario where you've spent out the lump sum, you're trying to get by with the turn by turn replacements, but every faction in the game will reach an exhaustion point, and that is an element of the game that's kind of interesting. Once uh, replacements are done, you have the strategic movement. The Germans can move four units, the Allies can move six, and that's how you're going to get units that are brought back uh, from eliminated box you know, over here. Uh, they get railed onto the map. If you don't do that, they have to start at the map edge, which is going to be a really long time before they get into any other bits of the action. So you're definitely going to be using your replacement points strategically and your strate strategic movement really as efficiently as you can so you can get units back to the front. When that's done, you have a regular movement phase, so everyone will move up to their movement value, which is the third number on a counter. Uh, you'll then have your first combat phase, so uh, everybody that is adjacent to an enemy unit can conduct combat. You'll likely be doing, you know, three hexes to one hex or something like that, or two hexes to one hex attacks. Um, and when the first combat phase is done, you can kind of, you know, choose your combats in any order, but once you say, okay, I'm done, uh, then you have your infiltration movement. So for the Germans, only these Staatstruppen units can do uh, infiltration movement. And basically what it means is they can move one hex as long as there's not an enemy unit there, even if there's a Zox. So they can ignore Zox, they can move one hex. This can help when you, you know, conduct an attack, maybe you've eliminated a unit or forced them to retreat, you've advanced after combat, and then in your uh, infiltration movement, this guy moves to here or something. Um, and once you're done with infiltration movement, you then have a second combat phase. And that second combat phase can involve combat from any unit. doesn't matter if they're an infiltration-capable uh, unit or not. So that's how you can begin to have a breakthrough where you've advanced, you've infiltrated, you know, infiltration moved, and then you're attacking again, and maybe you're eliminating this unit, and so now you're starting to break open uh, the line, at least from where you originated at the beginning of the turn. 
Uh, when the Germans are done with their player turn, then it goes over to the Allies, who will do everything very similarly. The difference, the main difference, I'll say, in the 1918 scenario uh, between the two factions is that the Germans have infiltration capability through turn 9 with their Stoss troop and units. But at turn 9, if they haven't won the game via automatic victory, these units are replaced uh, for an equivalent unit, and I'm just going to grab a random one for ease here. They're going to get replaced by a normal 564 unit with a little dot on them. And this represents the loss of the German uh, sort of energy, offensive energy, spirit. Um, and now they can't do infiltration movement. They still have units. They're just not quite as good as the Stoss Truppen, and they can't do infiltration movement. That part of the game is where the Allies get their infiltration capability. So from the beginning of the game, uh, the French might have their tank units here which are helpful, and I can speak to that in a moment, but not until turn 9 uh, will the Allies be able to use their tank units to actually do infiltration movement. And basically the way that works is that tanks take the first step loss in a combat, but you sort of flip them over to mark the units that began your movement segment with them, and if they've cleared a hex in that first combat, and you advance, then this stack of units, without the tank, the tank that has been eliminated, can do an infiltration move. So they can move you know, basically one more, and then you also have your second combat phase uh, like before. So um, again, it's that sort of switch. The game really turns it hard for you to say, you know, that if you're the Germans, you're going to have this many turns to be on the offensive, and then the Allies will essentially get the same or a slightly different uh, version of that. Uh, in terms of additional combat modifiers. So as you can imagine, this game is going to have you totaling combat factors uh, on a particular counter. The first number is the number for attack. The second number is at the number for defense. So you have attack factors, defense factors. You're going to total up your attacking attack, uh, your, yeah, you're going to total up the attack factors for all your attacking units and compare that as a ratio to the defender. Uh, so in this case here, if I just did these Germans are attacking here, it would be 11 attacking 6. Now, 11 to 6, unfortunately, roll, roll, rounds down for the Germans, down to 1 to 1 odds, and so you'd be rolling on the 1 to 1 odds uh, CRT column, which I'll show in a moment. But there's going to be terrain modifiers. So things like uh, forest, like rough terrain, those will all provide a minus 1 to the attacker's die roll. If all of your units are attacking across rivers, that's also a potential uh, negative die roll modifier, as is attacking units in towns or cities. And then, of course, the trenches themselves uh, tend to provide a pretty hefty penalty to attacks. So in most cases, it's a minus two. Uh, Stoss troopin units, uh, if they're the ones leading an attack, uh, will tend to negate some of the defense of a trench, but it is still the best defense uh, spots in the game, basically. So you can imagine that a lot of your long-term uh, activity in the game is trying to figure out how do you break through the trenches and start seizing this important territory behind the enemy's line, or break the line in such a way that you can begin to roll up the line and outflank the opponent, which was what you know the World War I armies all wanted to do, but the trenches made it hard to do that, and it necessitated the change in tactics that we see in this game. And I think that is one of the interesting parts that it's not just a World War I game where you're just attacking in place and dying in place, but that uh, we are playing a 1918 World War I game where these tactics have now been in, you know, put into effect where we can see things change and we can see breakthroughs occur and we can see the scramble to defend uh, and contain the breakout or, or see it develop into something greater, which is interesting. Uh, so a really important thing that I want to point out... Um, in terms of the CRT, and this is one of probably one of the best parts of the game, in my opinion, is that uh, the CRT is not just like a linear progression where higher odds are always just automatically better. Um, it is better from certain perspectives, but the way it plays in actuality is a little bit different. And I'll, and I'll describe what I mean by that. If you look at the number before the slash in each result, that is the uh, number of law step losses the attacker would take, the second number is the number of step losses the defender takes. Obviously, the higher odds ratio you have, 
the greater likelihood that the defender's losses will be higher. So if you look at just even 2 to 1 odds, 0, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 2, 2, 2, 3, 3, 3, right? 6 to 1 is obviously better. It's 2, 2, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3 4, 4, and so on. Now that is better, right? It's not a whole lot better, right? You're seeing a shift of a couple based on a really huge difference in the odds. But what also goes up across the board just about is the step losses for the attacker. Now there are certainly CRT game, uh, CRTs out there for World War I games where the attacker losses get smaller at the higher odds, but in this game they get more bloody. You may not always want to actually attack at 6 to 1 odds. And in fact, if you have enough of, you know, die roll bonuses, you might opt for a 2 to 1 or a 1 to 1 or a 3 to 1 combat even if you're capable of launching a 5 to 1, 6 to 1, 7 to 1, depending on what you're trying to do. And I think that is probably one of the great strengths of this game, where it's not just get as many factors as possible, it's get the right number of factors for what you want to do. So for instance, if you can raise your uh, CRT odds really, really high, you have a greater chance of eliminating a 2 uh sided unit, a, a two-step unit. Um, basically, the defender can always choose to take one step loss as a retreat. So if this unit had to take two step losses, it could take one and then retreat one hex. Now, sure, they give up the hex and the advance after combat will happen and all of that, but this unit stays alive, which is important for the defender. They can replenish this unit on the allied turn right after the Germans and can potentially counterattack. And I'll point out the Germans do not get any defensive bonus from the Allied Trench. So you certainly could have counterattacks that are very effective. But by taking that step loss and then retreating, you are maintaining some cohesion. But if the Germans decided that they really needed to eliminate this unit, and really needed to take this hex, if they managed to concentrate enough for really high odds, they increase the chance that the defender will take three losses. And no matter what, one two, three, this unit will be eliminated, if that's what you want to do. Um, so if you're looking to take positions, then massed assault will be more beneficial, potentially. If all you're trying, trying to do is whittle away the enemy and plank away at their steps and just make it really hard for them over time to sustain a line somewhere, then you might opt for much lower odds, where you're guaranteed maybe to cause them one step loss or two, but instead of taking four losses on your side, no matter what, if you are rolling on the five to one uh, chart, then uh, on the one to one or two to one, you may only have to lose one or two, or you have a greater chance of only losing one or two. So it, it's just this very interesting, uh, it, it's not immediately obvious, but you get a sense of it as you play through the game. What do you want to do? What kind of attack are you going to do to execute it? And, and maybe in other games you could you have some sort of choice or you draw a chit or something where it's, is this a, like a prepared assault? Is this a heavy assault? Is this a probing attack? This game has that. It's just embedded in the CRT and you have the option to execute those attacks to the degree that you, that you want to. Now, there are die roll modifiers to all of this, right? We talked about the terrain. There are also air units that will provide a plus one or a minus one. Uh, the Allies definitely have the advantage where they can have up to three air units, while the Germans only have one. So a plus one from a German plane might be negated by the minus one of an Allied, and then the Allies will pile on their air, maybe all into one single important combat. But you do have the air units. And they can just be you know, picked wherever, in whatever combat, if they want to be used. Um, and you can do that once per turn. Uh, the air power doesn't have a huge effect on the game, but it is kind of nice. There is a little bit of a shell game. Does the German player use theirs, or do they wait to negate a, an allied one? Um, there's a little bit of that because you're talking so few actual units. There's not a huge amount of you know air impact there. Um, there are a few specialty units that can come into play. So uh, the Germans have this uh, artillery group unit that can provide within a range of two 15 additional combat factors to any combat which 
can make things very bloody, but can be very powerful to shift the odds in your favor. Uh, and they, whenever this is used, this also provides a plus one. So uh, that, that's another ability that in the early game, the Germans can take advantage of and try to bust through the Allied trenches somewhere. Um, there's a few other scattered special rules. There's uh, this Big Bertha marker, which should probably just be called the Paris gun and should show a different picture of a different piece of equipment. So that's maybe one of the bad things here. Criticism of the game is that uh, this should be so this would really be something different than what it is. But in the rules, there's a special option rule called the Paris gun where uh, the, the Germans can roll two dice and hope for a 12, and if they get a 12, then the allied morale goes down by one. Uh, but the Germans do have a reason to defend it because it's placed right around here on the map, and if the allies take it or force it to be moved, they get a morale point. So there's these little, little bits of crumb that aren't huge or crazy um, and that are really easy to absorb into the game. And there's a few other optional rules uh, that allow an Australian, uh, the Australian Corps and the American Division to work together and have special abilities like infiltration and adding bonuses to combat. They're just little things. There's not a huge amount of chrome. It's really, really straightforward. So any particular special rule that you would be reading really is straightforward and already fits into the broad game system's that already exist in the game. And it is really that straightforward, right? You're having combats, you're advancing after combat, you're maybe doing infiltration movement, you're attacking again, then your opponent gets to go. Maybe they have a chance to counterattack and beat up on your weakened forces that have advanced across the trench line. Um, but none of these rules are incredibly complicated. Uh, there's very minimal errata. There's just a couple of words in the rule book that needed to be adjusted. So do not be afraid of errata here. It, it was really straightforward stuff. This is not a complex game. It actually plays really, really fast. Um, and I'll say that for sure, that um, you're, you're, if, once you understand the rules enough and you play a couple turns, you're going to get through the turns like that. You're just going to snap your way through them because um, most of the time you'll have a pretty good idea of what you want to do, where you want to do it, and what it's going to cost you to do those things and it can play very quickly. Now, I was playing Solitaire. I, I, I lose something in that, right? I, I don't know what it's like to play uh, an opponent with their own uh, potential to make mistakes or to see something that I don't see or be able to craft some strategy that, that I can't be prepared for. Um, but I have to say it, it moved pretty quick, uh, and I suspect you would be able to, even if you're not used to war games, you could probably get through it. Okay, so my camera had a screw-up. I'm not sure why. Um, so I'll pick up where I left off, hopefully. I hate when this happens when my camera screws up. Um, that you're really going to be careful about your German setup. If you set up with your Stoss Truppen too spread out, you're going to end up in a total failure situation, and you're not going to have enough offensive oomph to make it a real exciting game. What you need to do is concentrate your Stoss Truppen. Wherever you decide to make your big offensive play, Try to get them all together in a span of several hexes, so you have a big, you know, fist to punch the hole, uh, punch the hole in the line that you want to have happen. And what's interesting is the Germans in the basic. And there goes my camera again. The Germans will get to decide: Are they going to uh, focus in the north up here? Are they going to focus heading towards Paris? Are they going to focus on Verdun? Um, the Germans have that option. So as long as you keep your Stosh troops together and masked, that will be better than if you spread out. So just a suggestion if you're watching this and didn't see the disaster in my playthrough series before I had to reset the game. Um, okay, yeah, I mean, I think that for the most part, that is all I think I need to explain for the way the game works. Um, again, plenty of uh, evidence to, to, to watch if you really want to do that, but this is a pretty straightforward game. So I think we can kick it over... Uh, to the conclusion and the real, the overall review of the game um, and really what I think about the whole package. So let's head over that way. Okay, so what did I think of the game? Well, um, I'll firstly say that the uh, components for the game are pretty solid. Um, it is a paper map. I know like some people like you know, mounted maps and all of that, and I never really care because I always use plexiglass 
And if you don't have any, I suggest you, you get some for your paper maps if you buy games with paper maps. Um, but the, the components are good. The map looks great. Uh, the paper map is fine. The counters are the thick brown core. Um, so they feel really good in your hand. They're nice and solid and thick. Um, they're clear. Uh, the colors match the factions pretty well. The font is all, all good and clear. Uh, the player aid charts are uh, good. They contain all the information you really need. I never found myself really looking for more information in the rulebook that the player aid couldn't help me with, so I found that was well designed. Um, a couple of nitpicks on the components. Um, I believe that the counter sheet that had the Plan 1919 counters had some blank counters on the sheet that they could have used for other purposes. I think they should have included some control markers. You don't need them a lot because what will end up happening is you've got your forces all along the trenches and you're, you can kind of see where control is. But in the dicey parts of the end game where the front line's broken up a lot, a lot of units are dead, there's a lot of empty space, making sure you can clearly indicate who controls what I found to be important in some of those spots. And I ended up using you know, some of these other markers that I had laying around to kind of help with that, but they could have easily included control markers and, and solved that problem. The other thing is, in the 1919 scenario, there should be a Japanese replacement marker uh, because there's a Japanese core available, but the, and, and there's even a spot on the game track for you to put a marker, but there wasn't one. Unless I've lost it, but I'm pretty sure I didn't lose any counters. So, um, again, the, with the blank counters, that should it's an oversight. They should have been able to deal with that. That should have been uh, handled. So it's a bummer that it isn't there, that we're, you know some of these counters would have been nice to have. Um, I have ways around that. You can always substitute counters or use something else. But it's a real bummer uh, that they didn't include it, but they had the extra counter space that they could have done it. Um, you can always make your own counters, and maybe I'll do a video on that someday. But... Um, that's a, that's a nitpick on the counters, on the on the components, for sure, uh, that I could call out. But otherwise, the components are, are quite good. Uh, in terms of the gameplay, I like the gameplay a lot. I had a lot of fun with this, so if your measure of how good of a game is it based on fun, this was plenty of fun. I had a really good time with this game. Um, I, I liked it so much that originally I wasn't going to do the Plan 1919 playthrough, but when I got done, I said, you know what? I got the game out. Let's do this. I want to. I want to try it out. I want to play it, and it was a lot of fun. Um, the interesting thing with the Plan 1919 scenario is it takes just a few extra kinds of counters, and I've, I've got some of them laying around here. Some some uh, newer tanks and some anti-tank units that add just enough spice to that variant scenario that it is worth exploring. I'm really glad that they included it. Um, if they hadn't, the game still would have been fine and fun. But it's that extra little bit that's this, the cherry on top, and I really appreciate. Uh, I really appreciate that. Um, again, the game is simple uh, for the most part. It is straightforward, which means you you don't have to worry so much about the rules than what you're doing in the game, which is really good. Um, the fight to get to each hex that you want and need is tense. Um, the uh, bloodiness of the CRT is interesting. Um, there's really nothing from a gameplay standpoint that I can criticize. I mean, it does exactly what it intends to do. Uh, I think you could probably, and, and I've seen people on Board Game Geek already talk about it, um, that, you know, this unit should have been on this front in this time frame. There's not a counter for it. Um, the Big Bertha counter should be called something else. It should show something else. Yeah, that's true. And I don't know if those faults are just inherited from the magazine version of the game from like 20, 30 years ago, whenever it was. Um, but it's not a huge deal. I mean, there was really nothing in the game, in the gameplay itself, uh, when it came to using units and playing things out and what can, you know, who can do what, that was a negative. This was a very solid uh, game experience. I, I liked it. If you like World War I... Um, I think this would be a very good purchase. And, and I say that because if you're used to um, World War I games, like 1914 games, where it's about those initial couple of weeks, 
and then the game sort of slowly mm, slows down, and then you've got trenches, and then eventually you stop playing, right, or the game stops, because 1915 is not as, as exciting, or you go to another front for 1915 or 16. Um, 1918 helps shake that up. So if you played a, a 1914 game, and you had the movement and rapid you know, advances and all of that, and then it slows down, and you want to see the other side of that tunnel, where the trenches are broken, uh, you get to play this, and you get to experience that. Um, you know, it, you will probably never have a scenario go exactly to history, because the German players never going to make those same mistakes as the historical German commanders did. They might make worse mistakes, um, but they won't make the same mistakes probably, and they'll probably do much, much better, um, but that can be the case for any war game, so that's not such a big deal. So, yeah, I mean, I, I, I would recommend it for sure. If I was going to give this a rating, uh, I, would, I would definitely say, um, I would say 8 or 8.5 out of 10, certainly a B plus or something along those lines. I mean, I can't, I, I can look at this and say, I wish they would have had the counters that are missing. And I wish they would have called the Big Bertha counter something else. Um, those are kind of nitpicks. Uh, but I think the game does everything it does so very well that it's definitely a strong 8 or a strong 8.5 out of 10. It's not uh, for any particular reason. You know, it, it's hard to say any game should be like a 10. Here, the game does exactly what it needs to do. Um, the gameplay is uh, nice and easy to execute. Um, it is fun. It has its little puzzle and, and challenges and how you, you know, uh, want to advance and, and where you can go. And there's replayability here for sure, uh, because you have the different scenarios, and you have a different experience. You know, in my playthrough, I had the Germans focus on the north and getting to the channel ports, but it would be a different uh, game almost if I were pursuing uh, a res to Paris strategy as the Germans, right? And we're fighting down here more than we're fighting up here. The terrain is different. The advances, you know, the vectors for advance on the attack are different. It would play different. I'd, I'd get a different experience. Um, and so there's variation here. Certainly worth replaying. So if you're, you know, looking at it, how many plays can I get out of this? I think you can get plenty of plays out of this because you have uh, the ability to place the Allies or Germany and all the different variations on what is your big operational plan going to be. How are you going to get the, the morale that you need to win the game or, or hold on? Do you go for broke as the Germans and try to win an outright victory, or do you take just what you need to stay in the game uh, and hold out till the end? That's, that's how you can win as the Germans. So you, there's a lot of options. And if you feel like the Allies don't have a lot of choice in what they do, then you play one of the other scenarios where it's the Allies on the offensive and they have to pick uh, where their offensive spot's going to be. So you just have a lot of different ways to approach it. Um, easy to set up for the most part and, and easy to take down and set up again and play again. Um, you can get a lot of fun out of this for sure. And even if you're playing solitaire, you can explore all these nuances. And if you're playing with a buddy, you can go back and forth and try out different things. So um, I think, again, this game does everything it sets out to do, and that's a great thing. And I'm really glad that a year ago, or however, however far ago it was, when we weren't sure this game was even going to be made, I was throwing my support behind it and said, yes, let's get this game made. I'm glad that I did that. This is definitely worth uh, the money. Um, it, it has won its place on my game shelf for sure. i uh, really glad I picked it up, and it will sit alongside other great World War games, uh, World War I games that I have, um, and good stuff. And, and I certainly hope I will get to play it more beyond just this time. For the review and the initial play, it um, would be fun to play against an opponent for sure. All that good stuff. So uh, thank you, Ted Racer, for another great game. I realize this is a reprint. The games have been around for decades, but I'm glad... And thank you, GMT, for publishing a new version, a new edition, for all of us who didn't get to experience the first time around. So I think that does it for this review, guys. Uh, really appreciate uh, your views. If you have any comments on the review, put them down below in the comments section. Uh, if you like this video, hit like. If you want to see more content like this, I do reviews. I do playthrough videos and sort of in-depth analysis of games. 
Uh, hit subscribe if you want to see that kind of content. We'll be doing other reviews and other playthroughs uh, in the weeks to come. So, see you there, guys. Take care. Keep on gaming.